Hello everyone and welcome back to Real Time. Well, it's that time of year again. Flu season. Yeah, in case you're just noticing, my voice is a little racked right now. I've been getting over the flu for the last week. <coughs> Thought about postponing another week just because I took some time after the holidays. But I got to thinking today that my voice is primed for Jeremy Irons impersonations. That's how it starts, sir. Uh... The fever, the rage, that turns good men cruel. I want to play a game. Simon says. <laughs> Long live the king. Too far! God! Anyway, so I thought that this would be a good time for my next review, Reversal of Fortune, directed by Barbet Schroeder and starring Jeremy Irons, Glenn Close, and Ron Silver. I'm gonna need a cough drop for all this narration. That's pretty good. Following closely the book authored by Alan Dershowitz of the same title, we delve into the real-life story of Klaus von Bülow, a wealthy socialite who is charged and convicted with the attempted murder of his wife after she falls into a coma after what appears to be an overdose of insulin. The film gives us insight into the defense and trial which led to his eventual acquittal, as well as the relationship between Klaus and his wife, Sonny. Oh, and in case any of you Lemony Snicket fans were curious, Klaus and Sonny Baudelaire uh, received their names from Klaus and Sonny von Bülow, who are depicted in this film. This film received a good deal of critical acclaim for its immersive tone and, above all, the performance of Jeremy Irons as Klaus von Bülow, which won him the Oscar for Best Actor that year. This is great. From the onset, we're given the facts by none other than Sonny herself, played by Glenn Close, who narrates the film. Which is actually a clever move, given the fact that the real Sonny Von Bülow was actually still in the coma that's depicted in this film at the time of its release. Yeah, kind of crazy, right? These facts alone leave Mr. Von Bülow under suspicion and become a driving force behind Irons' depiction of the character. We're constantly left to question the innocence he proclaims alongside his devious comments and demeanor. We find the film's answer to this question in a scene where Dershowitz is called out by a student, asking why he would be willing to take a case from someone who is so obviously guilty. Come on! It's the basis of the whole legal system. Everyone gets a defense. Even the devil himself, as it were, or at least this seems to be the angle the film is trying to approach us from. The film removes focus largely from the courtroom drama, instead in favor of delving us into the history and character of Klaus von Bülow, while also dismantling the prosecution's case. The attention to detail here is very comparable to David Fincher's Zodiac, and while it does remain reserved, it also manages to remain intriguing. The screenplay is sharp, though it's not quite as effective when it's passed from the leads to the less crumb crumb to the less prominent ones, and in turn that is one of the noticeable flaws in this film in that the supporting cast really isn't very strong. For me, it's the performances from both Ron Silver and Jeremy Irons that clearly carry this film. Ron Silver brings a passion and intensity to Alan Dershowitz that sells every point this film is trying to make, while Jeremy Irons delivers every line with the succulent draw of a fine wine. Seriously, I don't know what it is about him in this movie, but I love listening to Jeremy Irons as Klaus von Bülow talk about his wife Sonny in this film. Sonny always took aspirin. Sonny loved Christmas. Why did I stay at her side all day without calling a doc? because Sonny detested doctors. And Maria shook Sonny. Nobody ever shook Sonny. Joe? Yes, darling? Are you doing Jeremy Irons impersonations again? Of course. You know you're still getting over being sick, right? Oh, must have slipped my mind. You're a little weird sometimes, sweetheart. You have no idea.
Now again, the genius in Irons' performance is in all the subtleties of it. He's constantly forcing us to read between the lines and wonder whether or not what he is saying is truth, lie, or eccentricity. And I have more thoughts on this particular point that I'll get to here in just a minute. Glenn Close is a potent fixture also, a Sonny Von Bulow, and adds actually a lot of weight to Irons' performance also, helping us understand what could potentially drive this man to murder his wife. Now while there is a lot to remark about this film, and critics everywhere have been making these remarks for quite a while now, I do want to point out that I feel like this film is a bit overrated. Now I've already made mention that there were aspects of the supporting performances that weren't quite as strong as some of the lead ones, but I honestly don't feel like this is really where the movie loses its its traction. My issue with this movie is, ironically, one of the things that it was most highly praised for, and that is its tone. While I would agree that it is immersive and interesting, it is also drab at times. When there's a shift in the plot or we learn something interesting, the tone remains stagnant. When characters are excited by new information, we don't feel the excitement with them. When something horrific is discussed, we're sort of just left sitting there like, yeah, that's bad. Okay. Part of this is the largely forgettable slash melodramatic film score by Mark Isham, but the other aspect of it is really just all the parts of the film that are so noticeably trying to intrigue us that, well, really just fall flat. For example, there's a sort of subplot with the Alan Dershowitz character where he's working with a student of his that the film makes clear he was romantically involved with prior. I'll just go ahead and tell you now that there's really no reason that this information is continuously offered to us because it doesn't really go anywhere. He doesn't end up with her. He doesn't have some heartfelt conversation that connects this relationship to this case. And in fact, in one scene, he makes it quite clear that he doesn't really care about anything except this case. So why does this film continue to offer this information to us as the audience? I don't know. They really don't say. It's just sort of in there. And this isn't the only ongoing plot point that I noticed that doesn't really ever come to fruition. Similarly, they keep seemingly wanting to convince us that Klaus is evil by comparing him with the devil and Satan. But all they ever really succeed at convincing me of is that Klaus von Bülow is, well, a very odd person. Suspicious? Yeah, sure. But evil? Mmm... I'm just not getting that with all of the humanizing that this film insists on doing. And you'd think that they would instead go with us trying to suspect Von Bülow, but the whole movie is about dismantling the prosecution's argument, so it kind of undoes this. It just seems like this film can't decide if it wants to be dark, suspicious, or ambiguous, and instead what you end up with is really more of an indifference that gets reflected onto the audience, unfortunately, because with Jeremy Irons' great performance, you should have been able to fully cement at least one of these ideas, I think. While the subject matter is all very fascinating, I honestly can't say that I feel any emotional pull towards any of these characters, which admittedly is hard to do when your only real human character is Ron Silver's Dershowitz. And I can get behind him just fine, but it is really hard to find any human footing in this film. Maybe an example will better help express my point. I'm going to use Zodiac since I mentioned that film earlier. In that movie, you have three principal characters with three points of view. Jake Gyllenhaal plays the title character, a man with an absolute fascination bordering on obsession with the Zodiac Killer case. Then you have Mark Ruffalo, who experiences deep frustration knowing that he is never going to be able to definitively solve this case. Then you have Robert Downey Jr., who is in many ways the modern perspective, interested, but becoming more apathetic towards its resolution. All three of these performances are stellar, but they are all also relatable to the audience because each character is so clearly defined. This clear definition in Zodiac is the quality that I feel Reversal of Fortune is lacking. It's got the stellar performances down pat, but I don't feel like the characters' perspectives are clearly defined enough. Reversal of Fortune is rated R for language. For what it is, I do like this film. It's got a lot of good things going for it. My issue just happens to be that it's sort of a one and done movie. You can sort of watch this, get what you want out of it, and ultimately be finished with it after that. It still has some awesome performances that it can boast, but in the end, I feel like there are other mysteries and courtroom dramas that you could watch and ultimately get more out of. I am giving Reversal of Fortune a three and a half out of five. Well, that's a start. 
Guys, thank you so much again for watching and for bearing with my voice. I am now going to try to focus on getting better so that I can continue to get some good reviews out for you. Uh, don't forget to hit that little like button down below and maybe subscribe if you want to see some more. Likes! Likes for the joke! I appreciate you guys again so much. Don't forget, you're on Real Time with Joe. <laughs>